On the news hour tonight, a pivotal vote. The U.S. House Judiciary Committee approves the charges against the president, clearing the way for the full House of Representatives to impeach President Trump. Then, after nearly two years of tariffs, the White House reaches the first phase of a deal with China. But how close does it come to ending the trade war? And it's Friday. Mark Shields and David Brooks are here to analyze the news on impeachment and the Justice Department's findings on the origins of the Russia probe. Plus, fighting bigotry with music. How a city in North Carolina made a ban from across the globe feel right at home. Music is one of those things in life where there are no barriers or borders. And as musicians, this is what gives us the courage to travel very far away from our Sahara Desert. All that and more on tonight's PBS NewsHour. Major funding for the PBS NewsHour has been provided by for 160 years. BNSF, the engine that connects us. When it comes to wireless, Consumer Cellular gives its customers the choice. Our no-contract plans give you as much or as little talk, text, and data as you want. And our U.S.-based customer service team is on hand to help. To learn more, go to ConsumerCellular.tv. Warner Brothers Pictures. The John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, fostering informed and engaged communities. More at kf.org. The Ford Foundation, working with visionaries on the front lines of social change worldwide. And with the ongoing support of these institutions. And Friends of the News Hour. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. The stage is now set for the U.S. House of Representatives to impeach the President of the United States. The latest moves came earlier today in a matter of minutes after long hours of hearings. Congressional correspondent Lisa Desjardins begins our coverage. Ms. Lofgren. Aye. Ms. Lofgren votes aye. Ms. With Demi a string aye. of ayes, Ms. Democrats aye. on the House Judiciary Mr. Committee yes. took a historic Mr. step Mr. on yes. articles of impeachment against President aye. Trump. The article is agreed to. The resolution is amended, is ordered, reported favorably to the House. The nine-page articles make two charges against the president, abuse of power and obstruction of Congress. The committee decisions today came after a marathon debate session yesterday that lasted 14 hours and went late into the night. The votes were straight along party lines and quick, as were comments afterward by committee chairman Jerry Nadler. Today is a solemn and sad day. For the third time in a little over a century and a half, the House Judiciary Committee has voted articles of impeachment against the president for abuse of power and obstruction of Congress. The House will act expeditiously. President Trump, hosting the president of Paraguay at the White House, railed against the votes. It's a witch hunt. It's a sham. It's a hoax. Uh, nothing was done wrong. Zero was done wrong. It's a scam. It's something that shouldn't be allowed. And it's a very bad thing for our country. And you're trivializing impeachment. And the I word sham what, was a Republican theme, echoed by Senate Judiciary Chair Lindsey Graham. He stated simply that this impeachment is a sad, ridiculous sham and needs to come to a quick end. 
An end, one way or the other, would come in a Senate trial if articles are approved by the full House. But some of the president's other Republican allies in the House are hoping for a longer, more fulsome trial. Louis Gohmert of Texas. Senate, but I really hope and pray the Senate will not just pick it up and dismiss it. America needs to hear from the witnesses. A major voice in whether witnesses are called will be Senate Majority Leader Republican Mitch McConnell. He cannot determine trial rules on his own. Essentially, a majority of senators does that. But last night, McConnell told Fox about News about forward. his planned approach. And everything I do during this, I'm coordinating with White House counsel. There will be no difference between the president's position and our position as to uh, how to handle this. There's no chance the president's going to be removed from office. Democrats on the House Judiciary Committee balked at that. Pramila Jayapal of Washington State. Where the foreman of the jury, Mitch McConnell, the guy that decides all the rules, is actually going to coordinate with the defendant. That makes no sense whatsoever. It is an outrage. And frankly, it's a, it's, it's a, a tremendous disrespect to the Constitution and to our framers. As to the political consequences, Democrat Steve Cohen of Tennessee said it's not clear for either side. Regardless, I think this is something we needed to do. I don't know that it helps or hurts. The articles of impeachment now head to a vote in the full House of Representatives next week. And congressional correspondent Lisa Desjardins joins me now. Hello, Lisa. So this vote by the Judiciary Committee was supposed to happen last night. They put it off until this morning. Tell us what happened and why does that matter? First of all, I want to note, this is something that is very detailed and kind of wonky to talk about. It's not something we usually bring up, the timing of a vote, but it is significant because of the friction happening right now. Uh, Republicans expected this vote to happen last night. They spent all day putting forth their amendments, and then they stopped. They could have gone all night, but they stopped thinking that a vote was imminent, that there was sort of a deal to move to a vote. And then listen to what happened as they thought the final votes on the articles of impeachment would be coming. Here's Chairman Jerry Nadler. It has been a long two days of consideration of these articles, and it is now very late at night. I want the members on both sides of the aisle to think about what has happened over these last two days and to search their consciences before we cast our final votes. Therefore, the committee will now stand in recess until tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. The committee is in recess. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. There was no consulting from the minority ranking member on your schedule for tomorrow, in which you just blown up schedules for everyone. You chose not to consult the ranking member on a schedule issue of this magnitude. So typical. So typical. And I think that's why we wanted to raise this. This kind of um, activity is actually unusual. Usually the ranking member and the chairman talk about basic stuff like this. But Judy, here's where we are, where they can't agree or talk even about uh, the closing time for votes or when votes are happening. And this is just added to this atmosphere sort of, of anger. I talked to Sheila Jackson Lee, who's on the committee from Texas. She said she does have empathy for Republicans, that their expectation that they would get something like a scheduling announcement. But she said, we really felt it was so important to take the vote in daylight. Clearly, just communication has broken down. Oh, emblematic of the uh, divide that exists That's right. clearly on that committee. So next, it will go after the House votes. It will go to the Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, what are you hearing at this point about the Senate, about Leader McConnell and what their plans are? I know it feels like we're skipping ahead a little bit, but this has been a lot. There's been a lot of news from Mr. McConnell in the last few days about what he thinks the Senate should do. And speaking to aides to Senator McConnell, we know a few things. One, he is cautious about having a very long trial in the Senate. He doesn't want every witness, perhaps, that uh, the White House or other Republicans may want to call. So what he's doing now is he's going to have a process where you will hear essentially opening um, presentations by the House, who will be arguing for impeachment and removal of the president, and from the president and whoever he selects to defend him. At that point, the plan right now is to for let the Senate to decide, essentially case by case, if they want witnesses at that point or not. It will take 51 senators to decide mm. on any kind of rules going forward from that. There's a chance there could be a bipartisan deal. No one expects that. But essentially, it's going to be a little unpredictable when we get to January. It's possible the trial could move quickly. It's possible it doesn't.
So, Lisa, stepping back, four American presidents have faced impeachment, three of them in the last 45 years. You've been talking uh, to people on the Hill about what that says. That's right. These three recent presidents who saw the House Judiciary Committee vote on articles of impeachment is significant, especially to longer term members of Congress and staffers who look at the span of America's 230 years of having presidents and say, this is happening more frequently now. This is a tool that we see lawmakers on Capitol Hill thinking about more often. There are, of course, still very relevant debates as to what is the standard for impeachment, what is impeachable. There just is a very real conversation about the fact that it is happening more often in this modern era. And we are certainly thinking about it right now. Mm -hmm. Lisa Desjardins, thank you. You're welcome. In the day's other news, the U.S. and China confirmed that they have the beginnings of a long-awaited trade agreement. The interim deal cancels a new round of planned U.S. tariffs against China and scales back some others. China, in turn, will buy more American farm commodities. Both President Trump and Chinese officials talk today of what's next. China would like to see the tariffs off, and we, we're okay with that, but uh, they'll be used as a uh, negotiating table for the phase two deal, which they would like to start immediately, and that's okay with me. The consultation in the second phase will depend on the implementation of this phase one agreement. So the priority for us is to sign this agreement and make use of the agreement to promote economic and trade cooperation. We'll look at the trade announcement in detail after the news summary. The U.S. Supreme Court will hear three cases involving President Trump's refusal to release financial records. A state prosecutor in New York has subpoenaed eight years of the president's tax returns. Several U.S. House committees are seeking bank records. Lower courts have ruled against Mr. Trump. In Britain, Prime Minister Boris Johnson called for unity after winning a resounding new mandate to carry out Brexit. His conservatives captured a commanding majority in Parliament in Tuesday's election. That clears the way for Britain to quit the European Union at the end of January. Robert Preston of Independent Television News reports. Sheer jubilation after the Queen confirmed he's staying as Prime Minister, celebrating the best election result for a Tory leader since Margaret Thatcher's in 1987. Now, all the more remarkable because just six months ago, his party was wiped out in elections for the European Parliament. And what's even more remarkable is that he won seats from Labour that have never been Tory in modern times. To all those who voted for us for the first time and those whose pencils may have wavered over the ballot, and who heard the voices of their parents and their grandparents whispering anxiously in their ears. I say thank you for the trust you have placed in us and in me, and we will work round the clock to repay your trust. What propelled him to victory was his slogan, Get Brexit Done. And today he begged a country torn apart by Brexit to come back together. After three, years, three and a half years, after all, an increasingly arid argument. I urge everyone to find closure and to let the healing begin. It was that famous bong. It is now 10 o'clock and we can reveal the full details of the joint broadcaster's exit poll. That confirmed a political earthquake. A large conservative majority. Labour seat after Labour seat fell to the Tories, starting with Workington and Blythe Valley. 20,000... All through the former industrial heartlands of the Midlands, Wales and the North. I will not lead the party in any future general election campaign. I will discuss with our party to ensure there is a process now of reflection on this result. It's over, Mr Corbyn, isn't it? It's over, isn't it? It is over for Jeremy Corbyn, though he'll stay for a few months till a successor is chosen by Labour members. Quite a Christmas present for him. Just a few weeks ago, he was Parliament's hostage, not enough MPs to govern, and now his majority is so big, he can be confident of living here and being our Prime Minister for many years. Thank you all very much, and happy Christmas. Thank you. 
That report from Robert Preston of Independent Television News. In Algeria, a former prime minister has been elected president despite a boycott by pro-democracy forces. Officials say that Abdel Majid Taboon received 58 percent of the vote yesterday. They said turnout was 40 percent. Today, thousands of protesters turned out in Algiers and other cities. They charged Taboon is beholden to the same military-backed elite that has ruled for decades. A search team in New Zealand has recovered the bodies of six of the 16 people killed in a volcanic eruption. They are believed to have been Australian tourists. The volcano on White Island was still spewing toxic gases today, making the search a high-risk operation. Two people are still missing. Some 200 countries struggled today to reach agreement as a climate summit wound down in Madrid. It appeared the so-called COP25 gathering could put off action on key issues for another year. Meanwhile, in Brussels, European Union leaders pledged to make the bloc carbon neutral by 2050. We want Europe as the first climate neutral continent. We took this decision with respect for many concerns of different countries because we know that it is important to take into consideration the different national circumstances and also different starting points. Poland was the only EU member nation not to sign on to the agreement. On Wall Street, stocks managed minimal gains as investors weighed the worth of the trade deal with China. The Dow Jones Industrial Average was up three points to close at 28,135. The Nasdaq rose 17 points, and the S&P 500 added a fraction. And veteran actor Danny Aiello died overnight in New Jersey after a brief illness. His breakthrough came in Moonstruck in 1987 as Cher's jilted lover. He also played pizza shop owner Sal in Spike Lee's Do the Right Thing and earned an Oscar nomination. Other movie credits included Fort Apache, The Bronx, and Once Upon a Time in America. Danny Aiello was 86 years old. Still to come on the news hour as the U.S. and China reach a deal, how close are we to the end of the trade war? Mark Shields and David Brooks consider what brought the Congress to the precipice of impeachment and much more. This is the PBS News Hour from WETA Studios in Washington and in the West from the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism at Arizona State University. As we reported, the Trump administration in China today announced phase one of a deal to de-escalate the trade war between the world's two largest economies. But the agreement has produced many questions and criticism. Nick Schifrin is here with the story. Judy, the Trump administration portrays this deal as a major victory that could lead to fundamental change by China at little cost to the U.S. A senior administration official said China had agreed to structural reforms on behavior that's long concerned the U.S., intellectual property theft, forcing U.S. companies in China to transfer their technology and currency and foreign exchange manipulation, among others. And China committed over the next two years to purchase $200 billion in American agriculture, manufacturing, and energy products. In return, the U.S. dropped a new round of tariffs, tariffs scheduled to take effect on Sunday, and reduced a previous round of tariffs. All told, those changes would affect more than $350 billion worth of goods. To talk about this, I'm joined by Mary Lovely, professor of economics at Syracuse University and senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Welcome to the news hour. Thanks very much. Thank you, Nick. We can't read the actual deal yet, but the administration describes this as significant, very significant, in fact. How do you assess the significance of this deal? Well, I think on net, it's good news in the short run for the American economy. We have some lifting of the tariffs. Uh, we have a, a deal. And uh, the longer this went on, it seemed the more it was a drag on business confidence. Uh, GDP growth has been held back by uh, really a major slowing down of business fixed investment. And so we're hoping that businesses will see this as potentially a, a pathway to uh, trade peace and begin to invest again. Of course, the tariffs have kind of thrown their plans for where they're going to get their supplies and where they're going to sell. And so at least a little bit of certainty on that is good. 
Let's look at some of the specifics. Uh, the administration is claiming China has agreed to fundamental reforms, most notably intellectual property, theft, forced technology transfers. These are things the U.S. has long complained about. Is there any indication that China is actually willing to deliver fundamental reforms? Well, China has been making changes in its law. And I think we're going to see a lot of those changes sort of packaged in this with a nice bow put on top. Um, so, for example, intellectual property, it's been tightening both the, the law, the ability to police it, uh, how those things are adjudicated. An important step they took last year was to create, like, uh, we would think of it as an appellate court at, this, at the central government level, because a lot of these uh, uh, concerns happen at the local level. And one of the big complaints American businesses have had is that, you know, we can't have the same guys uh, at, the pro at the provincial level who are part owners in the business that we say is stealing our stuff deciding whether or not that theft is actually happening. So now there's an another level that, that those businesses can take these claims. So on that, China was already doing things. On forced technology, they created this new foreign investment law last January, which clearly states that foreign uh, investors need to be free of any kind of coercion on their technology. So a lot of these things were happening, at least on paper. The administration says that China is going to buy 40 to $50 billion of agricultural goods this year and next year. Uh, we got a statement today from a group, Farmers for Free Trade, questioning that hoping that, quote, this is not an empty political process, promise. Uh, is there any indication that China can and wants to purchase that many goods from American farmers? Well, frankly, I'm surprised that the totals are that high. Uh, the maximum amount of agricultural exports that we've ever sold China was in 2017. Uh, and it was about half of that. So it was 27,000. So, you know, a little, uh, uh, 27 billion, I'm sorry. It's about half of what the, the, the maximum amount is here, 50 billion. So it's really hard to see where they're going to put them. Plus, the Chinese economy has been slowing, which would slow the demand. There has been political criticism today of this deal. Uh, we can show a tweet by uh, top Democrat uh, in the Senate, Chuck Schumer. Uh, quote, President Trump has sold out for a temporary and unreliable promise from China to purchase some soybeans. Is the Chinese promise temporary and unreliable? Well, I think um, Senator Schumer believes that this trade war would have led to better outcomes. I personally do not think that is true. Uh, this is not the way to get change in China. We are seeing dramatic changes in the political system in China, a massive increase in uh, the role of the state, a lot of investment going into state-owned enterprises. We're seeing political repression in many ways. Uh, those are changes the U.S. has to deal with in a smart way. This blunt force instrument wasn't getting us anywhere. It was hurting American consumers, hurting American businesses. What are we getting out of it? I'm not sure uh, what Senator Schumer thinks about we, where we were going to go, but I didn't see this going anywhere in a positive direction. So I'm happy that we at least called the ceasefire today. So the hurdle for phase one has been high, and, and phase two is, is even bigger, right? I mean, more fundamental reforms. Uh, how far are we away from the end of the trade war? So I think we're very far away from the end of the trade war. What we packed into phase two are the difficult things, uh, industrial subsidies in particular, since this is, these subsidies are fundamental to China's development plans, to reorienting its economy toward higher wage, higher, higher capital intensive activities, uh, and moving into the so-called emerging technologies like electronic vehicles. We also left uh, aside issues having to do with market access, having a uh, level playing ground uh, for our tech companies, for our financial companies. Companies. Uh, those are going to be very difficult. They're going to move into other issues, including uh, censorship of the internet, uh, Chinese control of their own financial markets, uh, and national security. And we know those are going to be tough. And so not a lot of progress before the election in the U.S., probably. I do not think so, no. Mary Lovely of Syracuse University and the Peterson Institute of Interna International Economics, thank you very much. Thank you. Stay with us coming up on the news hour. The author of Antisocial, Online Extremist Techno Utopians, and the Hijacking of the American Conversation. And from the Sahara to the Carolinas, the power of music in the fight against bigotry. 
Abuse of power and obstruction of Congress. As of today, those are the Judiciary Committee approved charges against President Trump. Now it's on to the full House of Representatives to decide whether or not to impeach him. To help us analyze this important week, as always, are Shields and Brooks. That is, syndicated columnist Mark Shields and New York Times columnist David Brooks. Hello to both of you. So these two articles of impeachment, David, how strong a case have the Democrats made with this? Well, two things. One, I think they've made a strong case. Uh, I think he's, there was clearly a campaign to have a quid pro quo with Ukraine, and, and it's clearly an impeachable, impeachable offense. As for the articles of impeachment, I don't like them. Abuse of power, what is that? <laughs> like, that's not a criminal thing. Like, it, it's a vague construct. Uh, and same with obstruction of Congress. Like, these are, these are both extremely vague constructs, and I think they lead, they lead away from the what actually happened, what crime was committed, and what should the punishment be, and they'll lead to a, va a debate over these vague concepts. The, the concepts should hug closely to some sort of criminal concept that's in our court system. So we all have a history about it, so we know the structure of it. And these sort of waft away from it. So I think they've made the case. I just don't like the way they framed it. Mark, too vague and, and not uh, on the point? David, too vague? No, never. Um, <laughs> Judy, I, I think the best case that was made was made by a uh, unique uh, person uh, in the sense of Zoe Lofgren, who was a staffer for Don Edwards on the House Judiciary Committee at the time of the Nixon impeachment, was a member at the time of Bill Clinton's impeachment, is now on the House Judiciary Committee. And she, I thought she drew the distinction quite compellingly, and that was that Richard Nixon, uh, no com comporting uh, with a foreign power, not, no attempt to bring that foreign influence into our elections, uh, that he had tried to influence the election improperly uh, and tried to cover it up with the FBI and the CIA and paid for it. That Bill Clinton, no foreign influence, no rigging of an election, uh, he had uh, totally improperly and indefensibly uh, had uh, sexual relations with a 21-year-old intern and lied about it. Uh, but this was a president trying to rig an election coming up uh, in 2020, uh, using a country, uh, an ally, uh, under duress, uh, facing uh, an external threat to its survival uh, from Moscow uh, and from Russia, uh, and in need of our, our assistance that had already been voted for, uh, and asking for exchange to get that, um, to meet, or meeting even with the president to validate the new leader of our ally there, uh, that they spy on an upcoming uh, election in the president's principal opponent. And you're saying these articles capture I, that? I, or think they... that, I think they capture, I mean, I think it's pretty, I, I just think it's quite straightforward and, and, and clearly understandable, and clearly understandable to anybody. And I think, Judy, quite honestly, no Republican I know uh, will be able to explain to his or her grandchildren why he or she voted against this. I mean, that, that, that this was defensible, that this was acceptable behavior on the part of a president of the United States. I think they'll say, oh, I, I might have voted for censure. This doesn't rise to the level of impeachment. I still think that's their strongest argument, aside from just throwing up smoke. But, you, but are you saying, David, that, that there's another, there's a different article that they could have, yeah. should have come up with? Well, I should have gone to law school, because I'd know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't go to law school. And I, so I, yeah. I, I don't have the exact phrase. I just think the phrase abuse of power just doesn't, it just means nothing and everything to me. And obstruction of Congress? Uh, well, that, that's a little closer. But frankly, so many people have been accused and, and sometimes removed for office from that, that that we really undo an election over that one. Um, and I think something seriously happened here, but it was that, what Mark just described, but somehow the way we're about to debate this doesn't seem to get the seriousness of it. Well, I, I just think one side has engaged in the debate. I mean, the, the Republicans have not. I mean, th there was an acknowledgment on the part of Clinton's defenders that he had done something wrong, uh, even with, with Nixon, that there had been a break-in. Uh, the, the, I mean, the Republicans are just in a state of denial. They're, they're sailing blithely on the river denial. I mean, the, the, you know, there was nothing, nothing was done. This is, this is, Mick Mulvaney tells us, wake up and grow up and accept it. Republicans are calling it a sham, uh, a waste of time. The president himself is doing the same thing. He's tweeting a lot. He was out on the campaign trail this week. He was in Hershey, Pennsylvania, talking about the impeachment process, also <coughs> singling out the chairman of the House Intelligence Committee, uh, Adam Schiff. And here's what the president said. The president of Ukraine repeatedly declared 
that there was no pressure, but he didn't want to say that. We said, say it. Say it, you crooked bastard. Say it. But he doesn't want to say it. We said, say it. I'd like to force him to say it. He'll walk up to the mic. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> guys are total corrupt guys. So that plays well with Trump supporters, doesn't it? He's, uh, he's a showman. <laughs> and that's show business. And I have to say, I, I had a, a friend uh, come from, uh, he'd been away in Israel and came back to the United States. And he, he came to me and said, Trump's really funny. And I don't always see the humor, but uh, in Hershey, Pennsylvania, tens of thousands of people see the humor, and hundreds of thousands of millions, hundreds of millions, or tens of millions of people around the country see the humor, and they just think the guy's funny, and I, I like that. It seems it's working. I mean, he's using coarse, tough language. Uh, it's 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 not working. He's running behind uh, in Joe Biden and, and every other leading Democrat. Um, Judy, j just think of politicians, political leaders in your lifetime, whether it's the city, shining city on a hill. Uh, or the hope, uh, and uh, that's uh, or, you know to what we can do together. Um, you know what we owe each other. Um, th this is the antithesis of that. This is the politics of grievance. This is not that we are surrounded by those with whom we can work. We can reach across the aisle. We can that that, that my opponent is my adversary is not mistaken or ill-informed. My opponent, my en is my enemy, and is evil and hates this country and hates you. And boy, that, that didn't echo through Jim Jordan's words. I mean, he, Donald Trump has spawned protégés and, and knockoff versions. You know, they hate us. They're out to get us. Um, it, it really is, it's a terribly bleak and dismal and dark America that, that this president portrays and those who support him. Uh, you know, we've hmm. all based our careers on the notion that we can have a conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I stand up for those values as much as anybody. But in a time when people hate the political establishment so much, one of Trump's secrets is to find there has to be a stylistic way of talking that seems un different. And even for those of us on our side, have to find a stylistic way of talking that feels authentic to people. And some of the old communication styles that we used to do or that candidates used to do, um, I think that just is not resonating with people right now. And that's been true around the world. And you can get somebody who's conservative or progressive who doesn't exhaust everybody all the time and who actually talks in a normal tone and I, actually I, listens. I, yep, no. But somehow something has to change. And that's one of the things we've learned, not only from Trump, but the world politics. I, Some people are pointing to Boris Johnson yeah, uh, winning I, in, uh, and in Britain. I, I guess just, just uh, and I agree with David, but just, just one point, Judy, and that is at no point um, is there any celebration of what we've achieved in this country. I mean, the, the fact that we've cut the poverty rate among people over the age of 65 by two-thirds, that we've removed 85% of the lead from the air. I mean, all of the things we've done and are doing, we've got a long way to go, but we have achieved. And, and you know, th there are good things that America does. Two, in, well, in a completely different direction, two investigations I want to ask you both about. One, David, is the Inspector General of the Department of Justice went back and looked at the origins of the Trump campaign Russia investigation. Republicans had been saying it would show political bias. Uh, the inspector general said didn't find political bias, but he did find a lot of mistakes. What do we take away from this? Yeah, well, w with Fiona Hill and a lot of the people who testified, we saw the federal government at its best. And now we're seeing an an another side, which is incompetence. And I take them at their word there was no political bias. But there was certainly a lot of incompetence, and they were certainly spinning the game. And the investigation at Carter Page, just for one example, he was meeting with the Russians, and he was telling the CIA, I just want you to know I'm meeting with them. And the FBI did not disclose that fact that he told the CIA, which certainly makes it look a lot less suspicious than it otherwise would be. And frankly, this vindicates a lot of this, not everything, but a lot of the stuff Devin Nunez was saying, the House and Republican on the House Intelligence Committee, saying they weren't playing fair. And so this is a case where I don't, I, maybe there wasn't bias, but there was certainly a lot of incompetence, and there were certainly people getting over their skis in trying to pursue an investigation, maybe without as much cause as they pretended. What do you take away from that? Um, that, that there wasn't, I, I agree with David, that, that there, were, there were serious mistakes made. Um, and, they, and I think the FISA process is open not only to scrutiny, but to severe criticism. Um, but I, when Christopher Wray 
the director of the FBI, appointed by President Trump, says investigations were opened in 2016 for an authorized purpose uh, and with uh, the adequate federal uh, federal predication, predication, the recent word that is now uh, in vogue. Um, but he, he gets lambasted by the president. Um, it's like everybody got something out of this in investigation except the president who wanted to be a coup and there was no coup. Uh, that's it. I mean, I, I think a lot of people have to answer what they did as far as the visa, but uh, there was no coup. The other, the other report, and actually not so much investigation official, but the Washington Post has reported, uh, David, after extensive reporting, going back years, asking for documents that it turned around the Afghanistan war, that decisions made by administrations, going back to George W. Bush, Barack Obama, through this administration, uh, indicate that top officials were not telling the American people everything they knew, the truth, about what was going on in that war. Yeah, I found uh, this series shocking. I mean, the one thing, you, you always think, oh, we would learned from the past. And the one thing what we thought we learned from Vietnam was you don't lie about body counts. And it wasn't quite that, but it was certainly dissembling about a lot of stuff over a long, uh, over several administrations. And some of this is inevitable in war. I remember I read about John Hay, who was Lincoln's chief of state, or assistant. And he's writing these public statements about how the Civil War is going. The war's going great. You know, we're going to win. And then he's writing in his journal at the same time, the war's going terribly. We're going to lose. We, don't, we have no strategy. So some of this is inevitable in war. But the fact that they didn't learn the single biggest lesson of military history in the last 75 years, which is be straight, it's mind-boggling to me. And Vietnam was only a few decades ago. A few decades ago, Judy. If anything, this is worse than Vietnam. I mean, you, you think about it, since 2001, uh, the, the country has just been uninterested, disinterested in the war. 18 years. Um, the fact that uh, 157,000 human beings have perished uh, in this war, um, that a trillion dollars has been spent, misspent, uh, I think it's fair to say, I mean, on motor pools that don't exist, supporting troops. 200,000 troops that don't exist. Um, it was a total fraud, scandal, uh, criminal activity. Um, and nobody blew the whistle. Uh, nobody called out. I mean, it, it, was, it was absolutely wrong. It's indefensible. And all this time at home, what are we doing? Six trillion dollars in tax cuts. I mean, so, I mean, it's just sort of a, let it, let it go on. It, it, it just, it is, in, it is indefensible. We turned our back on the Powell Doctrine, uh, which, you know, if anything we learned after Vietnam, that you go in with a limited objective, uh, with uh, overwhelming force, um, uh, with clearly understood um, consensus among your population, civilian and military, all of that's missing. All of it's missing. And it, it's just, it's a terrible indictment. In a perverse way, it helps Donald Trump. It helps Donald Trump because it's the government lying. I mean, we don't, we don't like to think that we, we lie to each other, our government lies to us, but this is a case of lying to the American people and lying to themselves. And your point is it's gone back a long time. This is not a modern phenomenon. Yeah, and we, you know, you see and you don't see. Like, we all knew Afghanistan was a struggle. I was in Kandahar once, and I saw joint American-Afghan operations, and the American soldiers looked awesome uh, and fit, and they were really trying really hard. And some of the Afghan soldiers, like, I could have taken them on. Like, and I saw that, but I didn't see it. Mm -hmm. And when our leaders aren't telling us the truth about these things, it's hard even for me. I was over there. It's hard to really know. You've got to, have a, you've got to trust your leaders. And lives depended upon it. The fully two-thirds of Brooks. Afghans are diagnosed with, with mental disorders as of, after 18 years of war. That's, that's how terrible. That's the tragedy. Mark Shields, David Brooks, thank you. Thank you. On an average day, over 125 million people use Twitter. An estimated 2.3 billion use Facebook. We know these remarkable communication tools are also used by a growing number of people as their main sources for news and information. But as William Brangham reports, a new book shows us how social media platforms and apps can be harnessed to spread some very dark ideas very quickly. It's the latest in our NewsHour bookshelf. The creators of online platforms like Facebook and Twitter and Reddit all described themselves at first 
as having one overarching goal, creating a space for freewheeling open connections to friends and ideas from all over the internet. And in the process, these Silicon Valley entrepreneurs built some of the most powerful tools for spreading information that the world has ever seen. But in his new book, New Yorker writer Andrew Morantz shows us how these techno-utopians, as he calls them, built these platforms full of unforeseen vulnerabilities, and how a group of racists and vandals have used those vulnerabilities to, quote, throw the whole information ecosystem into chaos. The book is called Antisocial, Online Extremists, Techno-Utopians, and the Hijacking of the American Conversation. And Andrew Morantz joins me now. Welcome to the News Hour. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Let's talk about these platforms at first, the Twitters and Facebook and Reddits of the world. What are those vulnerabilities that you document, that you say they've been hijacked by these other groups? Well, the biggest vulnerability is also one of the biggest strengths of these platforms, which is their openness, uh, their tolerance of all points of view. Uh, you know, I make an analogy to a big party. When you throw open the doors to a party that you're hosting, one way to keep it fun and exciting and novel is to not be overly micromanaging, not police everything, just sort of Turn let the music it fly. Down, don't drink that, don't smoke here. Yeah, that's not a good party. You want to sort of let everything fly. And you also want to be pure and ideologically consistent as the host of a party. And the easiest way to be consistent is to basically do nothing. And so a lot of these platforms started out as techno-libertarian, techno-utopian, sort of just saying, we're not going to police anything anybody does. If we get told of specific law breaking, then maybe we'll take that under control. But anything else, we're just sort of going to let it ride. And the reason that I call them techno-utopians is there was this built-in assumption, sometimes implicit, sometimes explicit, that that would ultimately redound to the good, that the arc of history would naturally automatically bend toward justice. The more speech, the better. And in some cases, that was true. Uh, there were lots of useful social movements that were sparked and helped along by social media. But there was also an antisocial side, to quote the title, along with the pro-social side. And there was just this halo effect where for the first 10 years or so, people didn't seem to talk about the antisocial side of the social media atmosphere very or much. Or even acknowledge that it existed. Right. And all of a sudden, our blindness to that just sort of came crashing down upon us. You spend a good deal of the book, the bulk of the book, really, with the members of the so-called alt-right, this loose conglomeration of racists and anti-Semites and misogynists, some more so, some less so. How is it and what is it that they did with these platforms that, that that's so troubling to you? Well, so I didn't go into this looking for the worst people on the Internet. I ended up finding them, but <laughs> I didn't <laughs> go there looking for that. I was looking for an example of what's the worst that could happen. and. It started getting non-hypothetical really quickly when I started looking for open racists, open misogynists, uh, people who were expert propagandists. I pretty much found whatever I lo was looking for. And, you know, we're focused, as I think we should be, on um, what the Russians did uh, to meddle in the 2016 election, what they and the Iranians and the Chinese and others might do in the 2020 election. I'm, I, I think, as I say, it's, it's to the good that we focus on that. But... In the 2016 election, there were Americans who were not anonymous, who you didn't need a subpoena to go find, who were meddling in our election way more than the Russians were. And when I went to go ask them how they did it, they showed me. They let me just sit in their living rooms and watch as they did it. For instance, there was one guy in Orange County, California, who just sort of invited me in and said, OK, pull up a chair. Today, we're going to start a rumor about Hillary Clinton. This is Mike Cernovich. Right. Uh, and so multiple times a day, he would say, I want people to think Hillary Clinton has some mysterious disease that she's not talking about, or I want to talk about her emails, or whatever the case may be. And he could just inject that into the news stream by starting a periscope, getting a hashtag trending on Twitter. He had broken down the step-by-step -step way that you infiltrate the news cycle basically to the point that I could then pick up the newspaper the next day and go, that story is in the newspaper because of what I watched this one guy do by rallying his fans on Twitter the day before. And, you know, that's freedom, that's democracy, but it's also, I mean, as you'll see in the book, that is not a guy whose fingerprints you want on the national discourse. We, as you document, have always had fringe characters in American politics. Is it your sense that these platforms amplify those voices and simply give us a better look at them? Or 
is it actually creating more of them? Is it, is it enlisting new soldiers in their fight? Yes, yeah, so the platforms do change things. I think sometimes the platforms take refuge in this idea that, uh, the true idea that there has always been racism and bigotry and misogyny, but what they're leaving out is that when you incentivize shock and fear and disgust and all these emotions, when you... Quite literally in the algorithm. Yeah, when you incentivize it, when you create literal points, as if you're playing a video game and the more salacious words you say, the more points you get. The playing field has been tilted by these algorithms. There's no pure neutrality when you build a tool, especially when you build a tool that then becomes so hugely revolutionarily important to how people communicate and how people think. And I think the informational crisis is kind of as big a deal as the climate crisis or the city infrastructure crisis, because if we don't know how to think and talk and learn how to arm ourselves with information, we can't then address any of those other crises that we're facing. Facebook in particular, but also Twitter and Reddit and many of these other platforms have said, okay, we get it. We get it that there's a problem. We're trying to moderate. We're trying to police this better. What do you make of their efforts and do you think they're doing enough? I think it's better that they're doing something than nothing. Uh, for a long time, they were essentially not doing any of this. They're not doing enough yet and they, they need to be pushed to do a lot more. When you're someone like Mark Zuckerberg who has built your entire adult life and career and fortune on the idea that just by virtue of doing more of what you're doing, you will make the world a better place, it's an article of faith at this point. It seems like there's almost nothing that can dislodge that belief, uh, which is really, really dangerous because these tools, you know, there are massive, massive harms that are being propagated on these tools every day. I mean sparking genocides in, in, in various parts of the world. I mean, real tangible harms. And if we can't even acknowledge those harms without being told that, you know, we don't respect You're some kind freedom. of a Luddite. Yeah, you're a Luddite or you don't respect freedom of speech. It's, it's just not a good argument. I think it's, you know, freedom of speech is very important. I'm a journalist, I love the First Amendment. But Facebook has a lot of responsibilities and rights to curb this stuff. They have the resources to do it. And at this point, they're sort of just using it as an excuse to not do it. The book is Antisocial, Online Extremists, Techno-Utopians, and the Hijacking of the American Conversation. Andrew Morantz, thank you very much. Thank you. The van Tanari Wan hails from the deserts of Mali in North Africa. Its sound blends ancient Saharan instruments with electric guitars and has earned the band devoted fans around the world. During a recent U.S. tour, however, band members experienced a darker side of America. Before a North Carolina show, they received a barrage of Islamophobic comments on social media. But as producer Ali Rogan reports, the city of Winston-Salem banded together to give them a warm welcome. The story is part of our ongoing arts and culture coverage, Canvas. <laughs> The band Tanari Wen may have traveled far for this show, but it's on this stage where these musicians are most at home. They hardly speak any English, but here in North Carolina, they feel that their every word is understood. Music is one of those things in life where there are no barriers or borders. And as musicians, this is what gives us the courage to travel very far away from our Sahara Desert. Tanari Wen's members are Tuaregs, an ethnic group from all across the Sahara Desert. They're nomads who lay down musical rather than physical roots. The band's music follows a rich Tuareg lyrical tradition, gone electric. And they're rock stars in their own right, sharing stages with Robert Plant of Led Zeppelin, Carlos Santana, and U2's Bono. The story of Tanariwen follows the story of the Tuareg people. Until 1960, the Tuareg enjoyed autonomy in the north under French colonial rule. But then a series of dictators took control and subjected the Tuaregs to persecution, seizing their ancestral lands. Many fled to neighboring countries. Tanariwen's founders were among them. They met in an Algerian refugee camp in 1979. 
Abdallah Ag Al Hosseini plays guitar. Our music was born out of this reality of exile, hardships, and suffering. They moved to Libya to join a Tuareg military unit led by then dictator Colonel Muammar Gaddafi, who provided them some freedom. But Tanariwen fought with their guitars, not guns. They sang about their people's struggle for freedom in their ancestral land called Azawad. We are from Azawad. Our identity is our Tuareg origin, and our goal for our country takes precedence over absolutely everything. But none of that mattered to a few dozen people on Facebook who saw a post promoting the show and responded with hate. Any true American will not support this bunch of trash. Let them perform in their own country, said one poster. Look like terrorists to me. No way, wrote another. One even threatened to bring his rifle to the show. <laughs> Singer Al Hassan Agtuhami responds to the hate with humor. Have they ever seen a terrorist sing a song? People who make music are not terrorists. They are actually persecuted by terrorists. Tunariwen knows that firsthand. When Islamist extremists took control of their native northern Mali in 2012, Tunariwen refused to obey the extremists' music ban. One band member was briefly kidnapped. We know that some people in the U.S. say wrong and negative things about us, but we do not feel anything about them because they are wrong. And most people in Winston-Salem would agree. Hi. Wake Forest University senior Yasmin Shaltau grew up here after her family left Egypt when she was two years old. I'm constantly surrounded by people that are very welcoming. She's watched the Muslim community here grow just within her lifetime. They used to get together at a local house, um, and then the church space was bought and converted into a mosque. We've added a new building for a Sunday school, so that expansion is even viewed in like the physical expansion of space to accommodate more people. But that expansion in the Tar Heel State has created tension. In 2015, a man in nearby Chapel Hill murdered three college students, all Muslims. Schaltout said it was a reminder that there is still some bigotry in her backyard. So I do feel that sometimes my community is like a bubble and like it's been sheltered from um, all of these other terrible acts we see going on so close by. But in this area, hate against a few is mourned by the many. After an anti-Muslim terrorist killed 51 people in a New Zealand mosque in March, non-Muslims filled a local Islamic center here to show solidarity with their neighbors. And they did the same before the Tenariwen show at the Ramcat Club. This venue typically doesn't have a police presence, but because of some of the threatening messages the band received, the Ramcat decided to step up security. But as you can see, folks are still lining up outside, and the Ramcat says ticket sales for a Tuesday night are higher than usual. Honestly, if you didn't buy tickets and you didn't give these people money, they'd have no reason to care about what you're saying anyway. These are excellent musicians, peace-loving people who have a long tradition of making music, great music. Before the show, city council members joined the managers of the venue to declare it Tanari one day. We are happy that you are here. We're happy that you have chosen to be here this night. Democratic Governor Roy Cooper wrote a letter welcoming them, and local musicians like Ryan McLeod recorded cover versions of Tanari Wen songs. I think everybody has experienced outrage fatigue, where you don't know what to do. And so here was something we could do to show that this isn't who we are in this town. Tanari Wen has always believed in the power of musical camaraderie. Their new album, Amajar, features American artists, including Cass McCombs and Micah Nelson, the son of Willie. There is this brotherhood, automatic friendship, and acceptance between musicians. It lets us bond as soon as we meet each other. Their album title means foreign traveler. The songs champion universal values, love, brotherhood, and freedom. In their case, freedom for the Tuareg themselves. All around the world, their songs of longing for a lost homeland have opened doors. We keep asking ourselves how it is possible that people who do not understand us or our culture, very far from our reality, can warmly welcome and support us. Words can't possibly explain how great we feel about that.
Tanari Wen's new album is named for a foreign traveler, but here they were welcomed as native sons. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Allie Rogan in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And what a great story. And a reminder to check out our new podcast, Broken Justice. The series focuses on one state's public defender system, stretched thin. Missouri's public defenders struggle to deliver on the promise of justice for all. You can listen by visiting the Broken Justice link that's on our website. You can also find episodes on Apple Podcasts, on Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. All that and more is on our website, pbs.org slash newshour. And that's the news hour for tonight. I'm Judy Woodruff. Have a great weekend. Thank you and good night. Major funding for the PBS News Hour has been provided by. Mr. Jewell, I've got a few questions. I was just doing my job. So you have no idea who might have put that package there? No, sir. Did you plant a bomb in Centennial Park? Richard, this is a capital crime here. My son is innocent. Do you have any case against me? I report the facts. You've ruined this man's life. I didn't do this. Richard Jewell, a Clint Eastwood film, rated R. BNSF Railway. Consumer Cellular. Supporting social entrepreneurs and their solutions to the world's most pressing problems. SkollFoundation.org. The William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, for more than 50 years, advancing ideas and supporting institutions to promote a better world at Hewlett.org. And with the ongoing support of these institutions. And friends of the News Hour. This program was made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.